All right, good morning. We'd like to welcome you to Community Bible Church Online. Uh, as I stated last week, I'm actually gone. I mean, I'm here with you via video, but I'm actually gone this week. So those of you who are watching online are going to be getting this message this morning, which is going to be from the book of Colossians chapter 3. And I'm talking about putting things back together when you feel like you've been pulled apart. And right now, as I am recording this and the team is in here, we still, as of this moment, do not have the results of the United States presidential election. So people that are following this stuff are certainly still on edge. And there's a lot to this of feeling like we've been pulled in every direction this year and over these past couple of years. And so today I want to talk about what we should be doing as a church going forward. So those of you that are watching online will get this. Some may be watching this later on. Those who are in Community Bible Church uh, in person right now are going to be watching a message from Andy Stanley, but I'm recording this for you and so that others will be able to watch it later on. And so the guys are here. We're going to worship the Lord this morning. I'm not going to ask you to stand. We'll stay standing. But let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, thank you that you're in control. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your direction. And thank you that your kingdom kingdom is, is, is more important and bigger than any other kingdom. Father, may we be reminded of that this morning and understand what it means to, to bring things back together in these moments. So, Father, we pray that you will bless all that happens, that you'll bless these folks for watching this morning. And that, God, for those of us that live here in the United States, that you will bless and heal our nation. And, God, may you make us as a church a part of that. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to begin the worship of the Lord in song now. Hallelujah, hallelujah, 
right, thank you. I feel like we're kind of back during the pandemic again, where it's like an empty auditorium and there's only four of us in here. But we're glad that you joined us and we're glad that you are with us this morning. Just a couple of announcements. As I said earlier, I'm not here for the next two Sundays. Next Sunday, I've picked an older message. You'll be able to see that it's an older message. Uh, I was going through some of some messages that we did in the past, and it's called The Ripple Effect. It's from Joshua chapter 7. So that's what you will see on November the 15th. Uh, when you're watching this, it is November the 8th. As I said, uh, also, right now when we're recording this on Thursday of this week, we still do not know uh, who the President of the United States is. Hopefully, you're going to know by the time uh, that you're seeing this, this coming Sunday, so we can seek to get back to business and, uh, and move on. And that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning, about what do we do as a church. But before that, a couple of other announcements. You won't, over the next two weeks, be seeing like a morning brew. There's not anything that's recorded so there's going to be sort of a, a week where you won't have that and then I will be back uh, and going back to that so you may not get the emails you may get a couple of text messages and all of that but rest assured we're all still here I'm just going off the radar uh, for a little bit for at least this coming week so uh, I so much appreciate that and appreciate everybody that is here and that is helping us to be able to accomplish this this morning and still be here for you also the text to give number again Always have to bring it up. 1877-781-1599. Text the word give. I know also there's people that that apparently, which I found this out, are sending electronic checks and all this kind of stuff. And so we so much appreciate your support. I was talking with some of the staff this morning about this and about how incredibly faithful everybody has been, especially during this pandemic that's still not over. Hopefully we're on the other the other end of this thing, but we just just so much appreciate your faithfulness and what you have done, uh, continue to do to keep things afloat and moving here uh, during this time. Also, you pray for them at the preschool because our preschool is still uh, rocking and rolling, but every week, every day, it is constantly making sure that everybody is healthy and all of that. And so I want you to, to uh, continue to pray for them, and I know that they will certainly appreciate that. Make sure that you share these messages and things with your friends on social media. Net, for the next uh, we you've got this today. You won't be getting a link. All you have to do is go to our YouTube channel, that, that link that you've had in times past, because these will be uploaded, and you're watching this this morning as a premiere. So obviously it's not live, so you can still uh, talk talk to each other in the chat room and all of that. And we'll have that the same way next week. It's uploaded as a premiere. So you all can still talk with one another. And we appreciate you doing that. So right now, the guys are going to come back. And then I will be back with talking about how to put things back together when we feel like we've been pulled apart. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And so if you uh, want to open up another tab, uh, BibleGateway.com is a good place to go if you're actually on a computer and you'll be able to pull up the tab and, and go straight to Colossians chapter 3 and just pick New Living Translation and that's what we will be in this morning in just a moment. But right now, guys are going to continue to lead us in worship and so you join us at home. You hear me when I call You are my morning song Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind, the God of angel armies is always by my side, the one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine, the God of angel armies is always by my side. Strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom 
shall I be? I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. And nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. And nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. You are faithful. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind The God of angel armies Is always by my side The one who reigns forever He is a friend of mine The God of angel armies Is always by my side I know who goes before me I know who stands behind God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Amen. For those of you out there who are concerned about our future, for those of you who are concerned about our present, we have the God of angel armies with us. Whatever the outcome of all of this, we will be taken care of. So let's go ahead and take a nice deep breath with our Lord. This is the air I breathe This is the air I breathe Your holy presence Living in me This is my daily This is my daily bread, your very word spoken to me, and I am desperate for you. without you This is the air I breathe This is the air I breathe Your holy presence living in me This is my daily bread This is my daily bread Your very word Spoken to me And I I'm desperate for you And I am lost without 
for you and I I'm lost without you I'm lost without you This is the air I breathe This is the air I breathe Amen. All right, thank you. As we said, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3 this morning, and I'm going to be talking today about putting yourself, pulling yourself back together when you feel like you've been pulled apart. And we are, have been in just a really crazy time. As I said earlier, for those of you that are joining us online, I really hope that we know who the president is, but we don't know when I am recording this. But I think this message is really important because it impacts us at a soul level, which is where we should be living from anyway. So we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. As I said earlier, you want to open up a tab on your computer, and, and we're going to be in the New Living Translation in just a moment. But before that, let's pray. Father, we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to deal with a firearm instructor, and this guy actually was an ex-SWAT sniper. I guess if you're going to learn to shoot, the best person to learn from is a SWAT sniper. So I remember he was telling this story of how he was up and there was a domestic situation in which a guy had his family trapped and JJ had to get up on this building and actually had to take the guy out because he came out and started shooting at the police officers. And so JJ took him out, but he was talking about how many yards away he was from it and where, where he had to actually aim to hit the guy because if he did it wrong, everything could have fallen apart. And so, so he says, but when you take aim, you don't just put the target in the crosshairs. You actually have to do some quick math and adjust based on how many yards away you are and, and, and with your aim. And I thought, my gosh, I didn't know there was so much to recalibrating it and re-aiming and refocusing. But I thought that's exactly where we are at right now as God's people. We have been in a really, really difficult time as God's people, as the church in this country and in the world. In the world, because of the pandemic that we're still trying to recover from and hopefully are getting on the other side of, but here in the United States, I have watched so much destruction as a result of this election and people taking sides. And I feel like our souls have been damaged as a result of this. I have, I've watched people get involved in conspiracy theories. I've joked that I'm going to go form the Grassy Knoll Society for everybody that thinks there's any wacky conspiracy of everything that they think is going on out there. You know, you put on your little tinfoil hat and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of folks that, that engage in conspiracy theories that most of the time that's all they are are conspiracy theories. But I've also watched the, the criticism, the criticism of, of our former president and our new president, whoever that may be right now. I've watched the, the statements that have been made, and I've seen the if-then statements. If you did this, then you're this. If you voted for this person, then you're not a Christian. If you voted for that person, then you're this. If you did this, then you're accepting this. And it's all of these if-then statements, if statements. And what happens is we get involved in the criticism, and then it quickly moves to condemnation. So where we have taken sides, not just politically, but where we say to people, you're not my friend anymore. I'm not talking to my mother anymore. I'm not talking to my sister or my brother or somebody else because, because this is important. This is truth. This is at stake. And meanwhile, we're not even focusing on our souls. And I think it's really important as so many people have been pulled apart, relationships have been pulled apart, churches have been pulled apart, nation has been pulled apart. I agree with Ed Stetzer when he said this, that a divided nation needs a united church. It's really important. A divided nation needs a united church. And if you haven't figured it out, we're a divided nation. We were divided in 2016. We were divided before that. And the answer is not going to be who's sitting in the office at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The answer is who is here, there, 
God's church, which means we have to be the right people at the soul level. I thought, there's probably no better passage for us to go to than the book of Colossians. And if you've been around for uh, any time in the church, you've been a part of what we've done here, we've looked at passages from Colossians and Ephesians and all different places in the New Testament. Colossians is part of a group of epistles in which Paul penned from prison. So Ephesians and Colossians are sort of like twin epistles. You'll see when he wrote to the churches at Colossae, he said a lot of the same things, but in a little bit of a slightly different way than he did to the people in, in, in the churches at Ephesus. And so, but what he said here is really, really important because we talked about setting your sights with a gun. What you set your sights on is what's going to shape you. And I want you to see what he says here. We're going to look at this and we'll come back to that theme in just a moment. But look at what Paul says in Colossians 3. We get all the way to chapter 3 after he's talked about the theology. And he says this in chapter 3, verse 1. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ. Now listen to this. Set your sights on the realities of who's in the White House. Set your sights on the realities of your relationship with your spouse. Set your sights on the realities of your job. No, no, no. He says, set your realities, uh, their sights on the realities of heaven. Where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. I love that because what he's basically saying is here, you have to shift the perspective from Everything that's going on around you, from chaos, from control, from power, from criticism, from condemnation, from the conspiracy theories, from all of that stuff, and you've got to shift the perspective and stop looking at what's going on here and look at the reality of what's going on there. The, and what's going on there? He says it. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God who's sitting on the throne, which means he's in control which means nothing has happened that has taken him by surprise. And I have to say this, just real quick. He's not taking political sides. Jesus and God is not a Republican, he's not a Democrat, and he's not even a Libertarian or an Independent. He doesn't care about that. What he cares about it's how you and, are, you and I are behaving because we are going to be the ones as God's people to pull this back together when everything is being pulled apart. And Paul says, by, while he's there in prison, while there's chaos going on around him, more chaos than we could possibly ever imagine here, he says, you've got to shift your reality. You've got to set your sights on something far more important. And he says this. He goes on and he says, think about, here's how you continue. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. Now, he's not talking about being so heavily minded that you're no earthly good. It's not that. But he says, think about eternity. Because eternity should give you a perspective of what's important. So many people are caught up in so many crazy things right now. And I think one of the things that when... People ask me, how can you do so many funerals and not get depressed and all of that? Because every time I do one, it reminds me of what's really important. And it's not. It's not my politics. It's not my business. It's not what's going on in the local community. It's not even what's happening in the church. It's, it's what's happening with the priorities of my life. That's why, that's why the writer of Ecclesiastes said it's much better to go to a house of mourning than a house of dancing. It's much better to go to, to the funeral home than it is to party. As I've said so often, I'd rather go to a party any day of the week. But at the party, I'm not thinking about tomorrow. Often, when too many people go to the party and they spend too much time partying, tomorrow is very difficult for them. But at the funeral, at the funeral, I'm starting to think, what if that were me? I did something recently. I was talking to a friend of mine. And there was paper out on the table uh, where it, at the restaurant we were at. And I start, I start looking, and I don't know where I read it. So I start measuring, and I thought, I wonder how many weeks I have left. Like, how many weeks? If, if I get 85 years, how many weeks is that? And then I, and, and he's watching me. He goes, what are you figuring? And I, and I wrote the number, and I said, you see that right there? If I live to 85, that's how many weeks I got left. He goes, that's depressing. I said, not really. For me, it means that that's how much time that I've got to make a difference. It's how much time that I've got to love the people that are in my life. That's how much time I may have. 
if God gives me that much time. And that's the idea. He says, start thinking about the things of heaven. Start thinking about eternity. Make sure that you have that perspective. And he says, he goes on to say, because you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you'll share in his glory. He said, there's going to come a day when you're going to share in his glory because he's going to be revealed to the whole world. Because most likely when you're worshiping Jesus, people are going to go, really? You may get criticized from the outside world because they don't get it. But they should be criticizing you because of your political views. If they're criticizing anything, it's because of your view of who Jesus is. But if you're really living like him, most people are going to be attracted to you, not repelled by you. The religious people, the people who are trying to keep other folks down, they'll be repelled by it. But people who are looking for answers at the soul level, they're going to be attracted by it, just as they were attracted to Jesus. So Paul continues, though, and he says, because of all of this, and I want you to hear all these things he says. So he says, you put to death the sinful earthly things, and I love, I love the way the New Living Translation says this, that are lurking, not outside of you, that are lurking within you. We worry about all of the stuff that's going on outside. And Paul says, you want to focus on heaven? You want to focus on eternity? He said, because of the fact that God's in control, because of the fact that Jesus has saved you, he says, you need to put to death, crucify the sinful earthly things that are lurking within you. And then he gives a list. Listen to this list. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy. For a greedy person is an idolater and worships the things of this world. And he says, because of these things, the anger of God is coming one day. And then he says this, you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. But now, now we'll look at what he says, is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Ouch. And he says, don't lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all, and all its wicked deeds. And then he says, put on your new, put on your new nature. Now, did you see this, what he says here? I'm not going to read through all those things again. But he says, look, if you're going to focus on heaven, he said, now get rid of these evil things that could be lurking inside of you. We want to change everything on the outside. We want to change what's happening in the world. And what Paul says is, Focus on heaven and then change what's going on inside of you. Get rid of all that stuff at the soul level. The anger, the rage, the maliciousness, all of that stuff that is there. Now, what happens is, is when we're trying to get rid of something, it's kind of difficult. It's like these people that talk about you know meditation and, and clearing your mind. I, I don't know how people do that. My mind goes at like so many just RPMs. It's like it's, it's constant. For me to try to empty my mind, it ain't happening. And so now they basically say, well, you need to think of a mantra or you need to think of a phrase so that you're replacing it. And that's exactly what Paul does here. Paul says, you can look at all that stuff, but there's something that you need to replace it with. He says, you're going to take that off and you're going to put something new on. And he says, put on the new nature. And he says... And he says, that the, and your, the new nature that it will be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. And he says in this new life, listen to this. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you're circumcised or uncircumcised, huge thing that was going on then, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. So he's talking about believers. He said, it doesn't matter who you are, what your position is in life, where you've come from, what you've done. If Christ lives in you, he said, it's a whole new thing because it's at the soul level. And he says this now, since God's chose you to be holy people he loves, here's what the clothes you need to put on. Listen, clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, here's the kicker. Make allowance for each other's faults. Let me, let me read that one again. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone. 
who offend you. Everybody take a breath. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Now, right now, as soon as I said that, you're thinking, well, you don't know what they did to me. You know what the person did. You don't. And we get like breathless starting to think about the people that have offended us. And he says, look, you've got to let that go. Forgive, remember, means to cancel a debt. It, it means to cease to hold resentment against an offender. Because when you don't forgive somebody, you think you're punishing them by hanging on to it, but you're really punishing yourself. And so he says, you've got to cease to hold resentment against not just Christians who've offended you, but anyone who's offended you, anyone that has offended you, he says, stop it. And he says, remember this, the Lord forgave you, so you have to forgive others. That's the soul level. He, how has he forgiven us completely? Paul will say something different, a different way in Ephesians when he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. So he says, look, you forgive others because God's forgiven you. And then he says, here's the clothes you need to put on. Close yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And he said, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Not a peace that comes from outside. The peace that comes from him rule in your hearts. For he says, for you as members of, of one body are called to live in peace. And he says, and always be thankful. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of stuff for somebody to be telling me in a time when things are troubled, in a time when people are chaos, in a time when you have to take a stand, in a time when people are calling for you to stand up and say something. He said, this is what you need to do. Remember that God is on the throne and remember that you need to let go of, of, of a lot of this stuff that is inside of you, that is bubbling up, that is not only destroying you, but it's coming out and it's destroying other people. And he says, this is how you need to live. This is really really important because when we're being pulled apart, Paul says, this is how you need to pull yourself back together. And let me tell you what, folks. God is looking at us as his people because if we don't pull it back together, nothing else is going to do it. You can't depend on the politicians or any of the, uh, any of the other leaders to do it because if we have Christ in our hearts, he's called us to impact culture no matter what. Remember, remember the people that they were calling. They weren't people who won the popular vote. They weren't people who won the electoral college. They weren't people who had their candidate in. These were people that were living in times of great distress, often their lives being threatened for their faith. We don't even understand that in the United States. So he says, all these people are being pulled apart. Here's how you need to pull things back together. And so I think the lesson in the message is this, is where you set your sight, that will shape your soul. Let me say that again. Where you set your sight will be what will shape your soul. If you're setting your sight on politics and answers there, then that's going to shape who you are. If you're setting your sight in heaven and you're setting your sights on God and knowing that his, he's in control and that you want to follow his example, then that is going to shape your soul. Where are your sights set? I'm going to wrap it up with, with four things, S-O-U-L, that I can give you very quick on the things that we need to focus on. So the S, I want to give you real quick, stands for what we're going to call service. It's we are here to serve others. That's exactly what Jesus taught to the disciples in John chapter 13. He said, you are here to serve one another. Even in another book in Philippians, when he talks about have this mind in you, which is in Christ Jesus, that, that Christ became the ultimate servant by, by, by dawning flesh and coming down and dying on the cross for us, and that we need to follow his example of service. He said to the disciples when he washed their feet, look, if I being your Lord and your master did this, you should be doing this for one another. See, if our souls are right and we're focused on the right thing, we're going to focus on serving others, not getting one up on them, not criticizing them, not condemning them, not pounding them into the ground because we've got a better argument than they have. The question should be, how can... I serve. So the S is service. The O is what I'm going to call optimism. I, I don't understand the pessimism of some believers. 
I know if you read the Bible, we know how all of this ends. We know how all of this ends. Are things going to continue to get worse? Of course they will, because we live in a world of fallen people. And that's just the way it is. That means nothing should surprise you. Every once in a while, I like to bring out the quote by Steve Brown that I love so much when he says, when a dog plays checkers, you don't criticize his game. You're just thankful he's playing. Why? Because dogs don't play checkers. If the dogs play checkers, you go, good job, because dogs don't play checkers. And the thing is, is that sometimes we're expecting a dog to play checkers. But these are people that don't know Jesus. We do. I have optimism to know that every day when I wake up, God is in control. Whatever is going on around me, and I have hope in Jesus. It doesn't mean I'm not a realist. It doesn't mean that I don't realize that bad things can happen. But I have hope, and I have trust, and I have faith. And that's why Jesus told his disciples, if you have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you don't know how small that is. It's really small. You can move mountains. Not literally but figuratively, it only takes a little bit of faith and that little bit of optimism to look forward and know he is in control and he governs the affairs of men. There's a, there's a verse in, in the Old Testament that says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he wishes. He is in control. And I have hope in that when I get up in the morning. So you have, you have service and you have optimism. The, the you is understanding. I think so often, and I've been talking about empathy, I'm going to keep hammering it and hammering it and hammering it. It's the point of the, uh, of, of the story of the Good Samaritan, which we've heard over and over and over again. Often we want to get our point across. We want to get our truth across. We want to make sure that we let people know where we stand, but we never take a moment to understand where they stand. Because I used to have a mentor of mine that used to say things, he would say something similar to the effect that if, if I grew up where you grew up, if I had the parents that you had, if I lived in the culture that you, that you lived in, if I went to the school that you went to, then I most likely would be doing exactly what you're doing. You know, it, 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 it's easy when we, 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 to, for us to criticize somebody else from our perspective. But being able to at least step over and be empathetic and try to understand where they're coming from is really, really important. So we've got to strive for understanding. We've got to strive to look at one another. And the final, the L, I can't give you one word, I'll give you two for this, is let, letting go or just let it go. That's what he said with forgiveness. Forgiveness is ceasing to hold resentment against an offender. So much of what we do today tears up our very souls because we are holding on to resentment. And Paul said, don't do that. It's going to continue to pull you apart, to pull apart your relationships, to pull apart the fabric of the culture in which you live. So you and I have got to learn what it means to forgive. We need help at the soul level. And that's what God is calling us as his people to do. It's time for us, regardless of what has happened the past week, the past month, the past years, to zero in to look at everything that's going on around us and zero in on the souls of people because that is why he came. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth. And God, I pray as, as things are being pulled apart in every direction, that God, that we would pull it back together and focus on what's important. Focus on the things that are above. Have our perspective shifted. God, may you make us people of service and optimism and understanding and people who know what it means to let it go. God, may we know that you've called us, or be, rather may we be reminded that you've called us to focus on the soul and that if we will just make sure that, we're, that we set our sights on the right thing, that it will shape our soul in the right way. So may we set our sights on you. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And you're going out and you're coming in and you're lying down and you're rising up in your labor and in your leisure. 
in your laughter, and in your tears until you come to stand before Jesus in that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen. Thank you for joining us online this week, and we'll see you next week.